Okay, so I have a microphone. Whoop! And you guys are seeing what I'm seeing as well. Okay, so hey everyone. Hope you're having a good day so far. Uh, so welcome to this talk about actor-based development with Project Orleans. So my name is Chris Klug. Uh, I work as a software developer slash architect slash public speaker slash I'm a consultant, right? So I do what I get paid for. I think that's the way it works. And mostly within the tech industry. And uh, a while back, I had a client that needed something a little bit different, and I started looking at Orleans. And Orleans, if you look at it, has a definition. Orleans is a cross-platform framework for building robust, scalable, distributed applications, apps that span more than a single process, often beyond hardware boundaries, using peer-to-peer -peer communication. That is a lot of fancy words that says very little, to be perfectly honest. So I think we should go in and have a look at what it actually does. But before we get started, the funny thing is that when I tell people that I'm not so much anymore, but about six months ago when I told anybody at the conference or any of the speakers that when they come up and say, so Chris, what are you talking about? I'm going to talk about Project Orleans. And they're all like, what? Is that still a thing? Does anybody care? Um, and there's a reason for that. So Project Orleans has been around for ages. So Project Orleans was actually designed and built and put into production in 2011. So it's been around for ages, and it's been powering things like Halo and Skype uh, and a few other big things. So it's being used by Microsoft and externally by large projects that do need this hyperscale kind of thing. Uh, and it was open sourced in 2015. Still, if you start talking about Project Orleans, some people have heard about it and almost no one has ever played with it or tried it out. And part of the reason for that is that it is something that came out of Microsoft's research and was brought into Halo as an internal thing and then was open sourced and all the documentation that was there previously was very academic. It was about algorithms and things that was being done inside of Orleans and very little about how to get started and actually using the product. As of the latest version, uh, version 7, so they jumped from version 3 to 7 because versioning is hard apparently. Normally it's 1, 2, 3, 4, but in versioning it's 1, 2, 3, 7. And they actually focused on making it usable. So that is what we're going to look at today. But I guess the question first is, what is the actor model and what is an actor? So basically, an actor is a thing. It's a piece of code that basically runs in memory somewhere that can perform actions and has state. Uh, and in the actor model, everything can be an actor. So anything you can think of can be modeled as an actor, as something that's available in, on your server. So it could be your shopping cart. A shopping cart could be an actor. Uh, a user in the multiplayer game could be an actor. Uh, an actual game as part of a multiplayer game could be an actor. Um, I used it to model some stuff in an online auctioning system where each auction becomes its own actor because it just made sense to have it architected like that. So everything can be an, an actor. However, Orleans isn't a pure actor model, it is what they call a virtual actor model. So what's the difference between an actor model and a virtual actor model? Not a whole lot. The main thing is, when you ask for an actor in the virtual actor model, it gets created for you or rehydrated or you get the thing that's in, in memory depending on the situation. So if you're asking for a new actor that isn't available in memory or instantiated, it instantiates it for you automatically. If it's already in memory, it gives you a reference to that thing. And if it's something that has been in memory but been garbage collected, it automatically just rehydrates it back up and gives you a reference to that. You don't have to care about creating actors and things like that. It's just you ask for an actor and there it is. That is apparently the big difference with a virtual actor model. And an actor is defined like this, and I kind of like it. So an actor is an address, some behavior, and potentially some state. And that's kind of simple. And it's kind of, so it's an addressable, stateful service that can be easily created and called. Okay. Once again, lots of fancy words, doesn't say that much. But I actually like to look at it as a distributed IOC container with named singleton instances. 
I also love the fact that I can at an, a Microsoft conference now say a distributed IOC container with singleton instances, and all of you understand it, most of you at least. If I had done that at the .NET conference 10 years ago, people would have looked at me and gone, IOC container? What's that? What's a singleton? What, what the? Now we all get that because we have IOC and dependency injection built into ASP.NET Core, for example. So if you think of an IOC container that we have today, it looks like this, right? You have your application, it has an IOC container, it runs on one host uh, in your web app, and you can ask for services inside of that, right? And they can be registered as singleton or transient or scoped or whatever you want. But basically, if you go singleton, you get the same instance every time, and it's available, and it's an easy way for you to store state between different calls into your web server, for example. The problem is, in the current implementation of the IOC container in ASP.NET, is, or in .NET Core, is that you end up with this. So when you scale out in a, a farm, you end up with multiple IOC containers, right? So you have multiple instances because they're all part of each of the apps, and when you scale out, you get as many IOC containers as you get apps. Which causes some problems, because how many of you have tried uh, doing cache invalidation in a server farm and enjoyed it? <laughs> There's like one hand coming up and they go, oh, 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 nope, did not enjoy it. Caching is hard, right? Cache invalidation and handling things in state is complicated, and this simplifies retrieving it, but it doesn't simplify the state management and the cache eviction. But if you were able to do this, it would be a lot easier, right? So that is what Orleans does for you. It basically gives you one IOC container, or one container for all your services that is spread across all of your machines in your cluster. You just ask for a service, and you don't have to care whether or not it's on host A or host B. It just magically works, and you get an interface back, and you can make calls to it, whether or not it's on your server or on another server that is completely trans transparent to you. Oh yeah, and it's single-threaded by default. It's because something like that, that would be spread out in a server farm uh, that was multi-threaded and all of that, is really, really complicated. And it's too s I'm not smart enough to do multi-threaded computing. It's just way above my pay grade. This is single-threaded single by default, so you don't have to care about multi-threading and things like that. Every co call to your, your actor is going to be in sequence, be se sequential, which makes it a lot easier to work with. You can get away from it, though. So you can go multi-threaded if you're really, really smart, or think you're really, really smart. But before we go any further, we have to talk about Orleans lingo. So Orleans, for obvious reasons, coming out of Microsoft. No bashing Microsoft, sorry about that. I'm a Microsoft MVP, I'm not supposed to be bashing them. But they obviously renamed everything. Because we had things like Actor. Um, and we had things like Nodes and Clusters and things. But in Orleans, they decided to name a Node a Silo. And they decided to name an Actor a Grain. And you see where this is going, right? You have grains inside of silos, inside of your server farm. Yes, it is that bad. <laughs> it, is, it is really that bad. But it, it, you get used to it. It's, it's called grains. That's just the way it is. And it also, so it changes a bit also because you don't have an address. Because you don't need a full address to reach your, your actor because it's inside of Orleans, so you only need identity. You don't need a full address. So that, uh, that little thing I had before changes a little bit with Orleans you get a grain equals identity, behavior, and then potential states. So all I need to know is that in this case, I'm looking for a user um, uh, grain, or actor, with the ID zero call. So the identity becomes a combination of the type and the, uh, the name that you've given it. In this case, I'm using a string as a, an identity, but you can also do integers and, and GUIDs and combinations of those. Then you have your behavior, which is basically your C-sharp class. So it's a, it's a standard C-sharp POCO that inherits from Grain and implements your, infra your interface that you have defined for your actor. And then potentially state, well, that is whatever you put into member. So any form of variables that you have inside your class is your state. But as I mentioned, you have that virtual actor thing. So get versus create. How do I know if I need to create an actor if I can just retrieve it? And with Orleans, you don't have to care. So the general idea is that when you call the grain factory and say, can you please give me a grain of type iUser uh, called zero call, it's going to ask, 
one silo somewhere in the cluster for that user or that grain. And that grain silo is then going to go away and talk to the other silos and figure out, is there anybody in here that actually has that grain in memory already? If there isn't, then it's going to go ahead and create that grain somewhere in the cluster on one of the nodes, sorry, on one of the silos, and then return a reference to, to that, that grain. And if I want to get that again, and it's already in memory, then it's very simple, because it just runs off, gets the thing that's in memory, gives me a, a proxy for that, and I'm good to go. But the cool thing about this model here, where it automatically just generates actors for you on the fly, is that if this silo goes down, we have no changes to our code. We don't need to, they don't need to ha handle it any, any way specifically because it was in memory at one point. If the node goes down, the request just comes in again. It goes ahead and checks the silos that are left. If none of them have an instance of it, it creates an instance and returns a reference to that instance or a proxy to it, and we're good to go. So it's very, very easy to work with. So I thought we'd, we go ahead and write a little piece of code here. Just going to see if I can log into this so I can see. So I'm going to jump out of this, and we're going to pull up. You're not seeing that, are you? <laughs> that that's kind of sucks. Let's see if we can get this to be duplicate, so you can see my screen. Now you can see it. So I have this project here. I'm sorry if a little bit small. The code is going to be bigger, but I have a a silo project, a grains project, and a simulator project. So. And if we look at the, the projects here, the grains project that's going to contain all of my grains, or my actors, it only needs to reference the SDK. So you just add a simple NuGet reference to Microsoft Orleans SDK, and you're good to go. I also have Microsoft Orleans runtime because I'm doing some persistence demos, so I need another NuGet package as well. But that's the only thing you need in your grain project. In the server-side part of it, which is the silo, I add a reference to um, Microsoft Orleans server. It's the only thing you need. And now you're going to go, but Chris, you have other NuGet packages. Yes, I do. I have the Orleans dashboard, because I'm going to show you that. That's an extension. And then I have some other stuff around here that has to do with persistence, that has to do with uh, Orleans. Doesn't isn't necessarily something you need. And then I have a couple of hosting things here to be able to host my silo. But everything that is Orleans and makes me build a, a silo is in that one NuGet package. And for the client, which is in this case going to be my simulator project, it also has a reference to a Microsoft Orleans package, but it has the Microsoft Orleans client. That's it. So it's very simple. There's, a client, there's an SDK for the Grains project, a server package for the server side or the silo. And if you want to have a client, uh, you have a Orleans client package for that as well. And then inside of here, I'm going to go into my, uh, my grains project. And I'm going to go into its lo tra location tracking grains. And I'm going to first off start off by nope, introducing the interface that I need to create for my grain. So I'm going to have an I location tracking grain. So the demo here is based on the idea that I need to track something moving around. It happens to be me running around in Stockholm, because I got the GPX, GPS coordinates from my watch. That was the easiest thing to simulate. So it simulates location tracking, and to be able to track that, I basically just need a method called update location that keeps track of each user or each grain has state of where, it, where it's located at the moment. Then it also needs to extend I grain with string key. So that interface basically just tells Orleans that there's going to be this is going to be a grain. It's going to have a string key. And the funny thing is, if you go in and have a look at this, it doesn't actually include anything. There's nothing on that. There's nothing on this. There's nothing on this, I think. So it's totally empty um, interfaces. And the reason for that is that when you build a, an Orleans project, there's actually source generators that generates a bunch of code that gets injected into your, your grains just because you are implementing that interface. So it's kind of a marker interface for functionality. Uh, one thing to note is that it takes, so first of all, it's async. It has to be async because we don't know if it's going to be in memory or it's going to be a cross-network call. But anything that needs to be passed in in the form of an object, anything that's a complex type, has to be, lo be marked with generate serializer. It is not the same attribute as serializable that we're used to using in, in .NET. 
This is a separate one, and it requires you to put IDs on each one of your properties to get them in the right order when they serialize, and it has to do with using a very efficient serialization algorithm. So that's why you need to do that manually. Now, the actual implementation of my, uh, my grain is this. So it's pure C-sharp, nothing complicated. I inherit from grain, which is just a helper class. I define the interface or implement the interface that I'm, I want to implement, which is simply the uh, update location. And all I'm going to do in this grain is I'm going to do console write line. I'm not doing anything here. So whenever a grain is created in the constructor, I do a creating location tracking grain uh, console log. And then for each update loca location update, I do another console write line telling it what grain is getting updated, when it was updated, and the new latitude and long longitude. Very, very basic grain. So now that I have a grain that I can work with, I can go to my silo. So this is the bare minimum silo that you can build. It's a console application. It has a host in here, because it's built on top of iHost in .NET Core. So all I need is an host, add Orleans, and then start async, and then wait for it to stop. That's the bare minimum of a silo host that I can. But being that it's implemented as iHost, I could put it into my ASP.NET Core application, right? Because ASP.NET Core has a host as well. Or I could put it into anything that has a host, I can add Orleans to it. So all I need is to go in here and I need to add Orleans. Now luckily, adding Orleans is ridiculously easy. Use Orleans. That's it. And then we have to pa pass in a callback, which is going to be a context and a silo. Like that. And then we have to tell the silo what kind of networking we want, or what setup we want with clustering. For this, I'm going to go ahead and say use development clustering. So development clustering is for, actually, that's not what I want this time. Sorry. I don't want development just yet. I want local host clustering. Sorry. So this is for development on your local machine. It sets up a one sing single node cluster for your local host using 127.0.0.1 as the, the uh, IP address. And then I'm just going to go ahead and say silo.use dashboard as well, which is that ex extra NuGet package that I pulled in that gives us a little dashboard that we can look at. That's it. Silo done. Client side. Client side, I have built a little project here. That was not all what I wanted to press. I want to open this. So I have, once again, it's a little console app. It creates a host, it starts the host, and then basically it generates 10 simulators. And the only thing that the simulators do is that they basically, once every second, they give another GPS coordinate so we can see something moving around on the map later on. But that's updating the uh, a grain, basically. So to add the client part for this application to be able to communicate with my cluster, once again, we do use Orleans, but in this case, we do use Orleans client. It has a callback that looks like that. And we just say client.use localhost clustering, like that. And we're good to go with the client. Nothing else that needs to be configured. It just automatically works. Now, I need to get a hold of my, a way to access my cluster. And what we do is in here, we say var cl cluster client equals, and then we say host.services.getRequired cluster. That's the one that we want. So we ask the host. So when we call use Orleans client, it's going to add something called the iCluster client to our IOC container, which allows us to talk to the cluster. And then inside here, for each one of my grains, or sorry, each one of my simulators, I'm going to go ahead and pull out the grain. So I'm going to say var grain equals cluster client dot get grain of type i location tracking grain like that. And I'm going to give it name. So I'm just going to do name because it's a string. So name is going to be simulator one, two, three, and so on. And then every time it needs to send a new update to the grain, all I need to do in here is say await grain dot update location. Once again, you can see in here, once again, but now you can see here that on my interface here, I location tracking grain, it just looks like any other interface that you have. It has a few little helper things that has to do with Orleans with getting client IDs and things, or clients IDs, primary keys, sorry, and such, but also got update location. So I just use it like any other C-sharp class. I need to 
shove in point. Unfortunately, point is in the wrong format, so it has a two location extension method to make it into a location class. And that's it. I have now created a grain that has my state. I've created a silo to host it, and I've created a client that can, can call that, that silo. So if we go ahead and start up a silo, and obviously using local host clustering, I can only use one silo on my machine because it uses 127001 and a predefined port, and I can't move it around. But at least it works. I'm just going to allow it to access stuff. And then I can start my simulator like that. And if we pull up the, so there's my simulator, and it starts simulating GPS positions. And as you can see here, my silo is getting updates. So it's each one of those console. Uh, right line gets output out here, and if you scroll up a little bit, you can also see up here that it's creating all of the, the grains for me based on simulator 8, 2, 6, 5, and so on. And it just runs. And there's no code in here that I have to take care of to manage the fact that it's a cross-network call or anything like that. It just works. I just call my interface, and everything seems to work. So I'm going to try to stop that gracefully. Ah, no. Keep forgetting this. Sorry. Let's let's. I was supposed to show you one more thing, and I keep closing that too early every time. Let's do debug, new instance, start the simulator. I want to show you this first. So I added the dashboard, and the reason that I added that is that it's really nice to be able to see this. So just because I added use dash Orleans dashboard, I actually get a built-in dashboard. So the silo automatically gives me a dashboard that I can just browse to and get information about my grains. So I can go in here and I can see what grains are being created here. There are 10 activations of my location tracking grain. I can see throughput and, and all of that stuff. And that was just that one line of use dashboard to be able to get to work. So that, I kind of like that. It gives us a nice way of just quickly getting an overview of what's actually going on in there. Okay, so grain creation and setting up your first initial grain application or a Orleans application isn't really that hard. But there's more to it, right? There is obviously something that has to do with silos and communication and clustering, and we all know that clustering things and building web servers in farms and stuff is complicated, right? So Microsoft has tried to take that away as much as possible from Orleans. So they only have two ports that your silos need to be able to communicate on. So as long as you have your silos on a network where they can reach each other and they can use two ports that you can define on your own, you're good to go. That's all that you need to set it up. And by default, you use 30,000 to communicate with the silo from the outside, so with the, if you have a client. And then it uses 11,111 to have a gossip protocol between all of the, the silos inside of your cluster. So it's fairly simple to set up. And as I showed you, localhost clustering, very, very simple. Runs on your local machine, setting it up is this. Use localhost clustering for the silo, and use localhost clustering for the client. That's it. If you want to go a bit further, you can do development clustering. This is, by nature, not for production. It is called development clustering. Do not go and use this for production. Because what you do is you basically say, I have a bunch of silos, but one silo is the master. And if that silo goes down, your entire cluster goes down. Pretty shitty version of a clustering situation, right? But that's the way that the development clustering works. So you basically set up all, as many silos as you want, but you make one the master. And that's the one that keeps track of all the other silos. And all you need to do is basically tell each one of the silos which, where can you reach the main or the master silo uh, that has all of the silo information. And on the client, you then tell it that, hey, I want to use static clustering, and here is the address where you can reach the, uh, the master node or one of the nodes in the cluster, but preferably the master node, because that's always going to be up, and you're good to go. And then you can host as many silos as you want on your local machine if you want to. But a much better solution is using something called a clustering provider. And I really love this feature, because all you do is you, s you go in and you choose a provider. And that can be, in this case, I'm using Azure. So I'm using Azure Storage Clustering, which is basically telling each of my silos that, hey, you are part of a cluster, and all of the clustering information should be over here in ta table storage. 
and then I'm good to go. I don't have to do anything else. If a cluster goes offline, or a silo goes offline, the rest of the silos handles that. If a new silo comes online, it communicates with all of the others. So you can add and remove silos as you want, and they use table storage in this case to keep track of it. And to configure it, all you need to do is give it a connection string to table storage, and it does everything else on its own. And for the client, it is the same thing. As you can see, there's no difference except for use Orleans versus your use Orleans client. Other than that, it's exactly the same con con uh, configuration. You can also do ADR.NET. So if you want to back your, uh, your cluster by C using SQL, for example, you can just give it a connection string to a SQL database, and it will store all of the clustering information in the SQL. And once again, they look pretty much identical whether or not it's a silo or a client. And if we have a look at what that looks like, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do some silo changes or clustering changes on my application here. So I'm going to go out, I'm going to kill that first of all. So I'm going to start in the silo, which is here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove my, these things here. So I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say silo.use development clustering to start off like that. And that thing is going to ask me for an IP endpoint. So I'm going to go new IP endpoint like that. I'm going to give it IP address dot loopback. And I'm going to give it port 11,000 loopback, 11,111. So that is not configuring this silo. This is configuring where the master silo is located. So for my own silo, for this local one, I'm also going to go and say, hey, I want to configure the endpoints in here. So I'm going to change the endpoints a bit, and then I can go and say, okay, so I'm going to have an IP address loopback for this thing. Normally, you shouldn't have to input and tell it specifically to use the loopback adapter, but due to my machine having a Docker desktop installed, it actually defaults not to 127.0.0.1, it defaults to 172.0.0 something that has to do with Docker. So I have to tell it what IP address to, to use for this local, local silo. And then I can tell it that, hey, I want you to communicate on port 11,111 and port 30,000. Now, the astute person in the, in, in the crowd now is going to look at this and go, but if you pull up more than one of these silos, aren't they going to collide on port 11,111 and port 30,000? Yes, they are. So that's not going to work. I have an ugly workaround for this. This is not for any kind of production use. It is for demo purpose on my machine locally right now. But I'm going to write this. So I'm going to go process, get process, get as how many location dot tra tracking dot silo processes are on my machine at the moment. For the first silo, that is going to be one. For the rest of them, it's going to be two, three, four, and so on. And if the silo count is one, then I'm going to set my port spread to zero. Otherwise, I'm going to do a random number between zero and 1,000. And then I'm just going to go ahead and add that down here, which basically means that each one of these uh, the consecutive silos that I pull up are going to end up on individual uh, IP, um, ports so they don't collide on my local machine. This is only because I'm running multiple ones on my, my local machine. And then for, uh, for the uh, client, sorry, that was the wrong one, that's the one. And for the client part of it, I'm going to have to go in and make a little change here as well. So I'm not going to do localhost clustering. I'm going to do client.use the static. That's what I want to start, clustering like that. And what I need to go in here is the same thing. I have to tell it, <sighs> tell it new IP endpoint like that. And it's going to be IP address dot loopback. And it's going to communicate on port 30,000 with that silo as such. Now, that's all the change I need to actually change the whole clustering model for my application. So if I go and I add debug here, so I go and create one silo. I'm going to place this silo up in the top left corner because it's the most important silo. Remember to not delete that. Then I'm going to go and create another silo. So, de sorry, debug, new instance. It's another silo. Nope, nope. And I'm going to go ahead and start a third silo in here. And then finally, I'm going to go and create a simulator that starts sending out messages. 
And what you're going to see, hopefully, is that they are sort of, hopefully, somewhat evenly distributed across my silos, like that. So you can see some information is ending up on the different silos. And if I go ahead and kill one of these silos, not the master one, any of the other ones, that is going to slowly die. That sounds bad, but that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm slowly killing it. And once that is dead, you can see out here there's a bunch of stuff that says that one of the silos went down, it stopped working. And I stopped the wrong window, didn't I? Damn it! I, there are two windows I can't stop. There's a 50% shop chance that I'm, I'm stopping the wrong one. That was the wrong one. That was apparently the client. So let's try this again. Uh, okay, and now it breaks and stops. Sorry. If you close down the right silo, it will reschedule that load on the other, other silos as soon as the request comes in, as I showed you in the PowerPoint presentation before. It's just a matter of remembering to close the right console on this machine. Now, a much easier and nicer way of doing this is to use storage clustering. So if we go to the silo again, and we remove the uh, development clustering in here, and we go and we do that, so basically I'm doing use Azure storage clustering instead. I go and configure table service client, and all I do is I give it a connection string, which I've put into an environment variable on my machine. And I use the same port spread configuration thingy here. And then I go back to my, my client and do the same thing. I basically kill that, and we do POI5, like that. And I do the same thing, use Azure storage clustering, and I give it a, uh, a connection string. If I now run my silos again, I don't have to care at all. I, don't ha I can pull down silos in whatever order I want, and they will just keep on working. And in table storage, there will be a complete list of silos that are up and running at the moment. So if I start three of those, and I start my, my um, simulator. That's my simulator. That is not going to get killed. Let's put that on the side, like that. And then I have three silos here, somewhat evenly distributed. Let's take that one and kill that one. And that goes down. And the other ones take over. So that, that load is now being distributed on that. If I go in here and I go and start another silo in here, that silo is going to be really, really boring and do nothing. Because there's no load to put on it yet. So it doesn't redistribute any load just because I pull up a new silo, because everything is still instantiated on the old silos. But if I go in and I kill off that silo, hopefully some of that should end up on this silo instead. Maybe. There it is. Some of it ends up on this silo. So we can just pull down silos and add silos and remove silos in whatever order we want, and they just kind of make it work and store everything in table storage. Now, there's a cameraman right in front of me, and I always look like a complete asshole on those pictures. I'm going to have like a weird <laughs> like that. So, And that's when he took the picture, yeah. Um, OK. Anyway, silo clustering, fairly easy to work with. Um, Observing grains is another really cool feature uh, that I kind of like. So what we've got is something called an eye observer. And it allows a grain to push information out from the grain so that I can observe it, which allows me to basically monitor grains in my application in a nice way. And after that one slide, I'm going to go and go into demo again. It's a useful slide. Could probably skip that one. So what I'm going to do here is I have, I'm going to slide this up here. I want to want to keep track of the locations of my different grains so that I can show that off. And I have a little API up here that were sorry, a dashboard that I'm going to show you that's going to do that tracking. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to first off, sorry, I'm going to remember to do this. I'm going to revert back to localhost clustering because that's simple and nice. Very few things that can go wrong with that. I'm going to change that in my simulator as well. Gonna add that and remove that like that. Okay. So 
what I'm going to do is I, I, you, you observe one grain at a time. So I don't want to have to go and set up 50 different uh, observables for each one of the grains that, that is running in my application. Instead, I'm going to combine the, the list of li li latest updates into its own grain. So I'm going to go and add a new class in here. And I'm going to call it dashboard grain, like that. And then I'm going to implement that so it looks like this. So it's going to be an I dashboard grain. It's going to be a grain with a GUID key. It's going to have a add position update. So each one of the, the location tracking grains can go and say, here is my latest grain, and they're all latest position. So they're all going to feed into this one grain that keeps track of all the other grains where they are, so I can get a list of the current positions. And then I'm going to have a what's called an I dashboard observer, which is an I grain observer. And that's where I can go and say, I want to subscribe to changes inside this grain. And I do that by implementing an I dashboard observer. And I have on that interface, I have an on position updated where I can get like a list of uh, positions uh, that I can get out. So whenever it, the position list changes, I can get updated with that. Now, no, actually, I want to have. That was the wrong one. No, it was seven. There it is. So here's the implementation. Now, a little tiny tweak here is that the interface is called I dashboard grain. I actually call my class location dashboard grain. And the reason for that is that your grains are not allowed, the class implementation are not allowed to be the same name as any other class that is a grain in your system. And if I use the, the dashboard for um, Orleans, that has a grain called dashboard grain. So if you end up having a class with the same name, it's going to collide and say that there's already an implementation of that because it doesn't take namespaces into account. This can be modified, but by default, if you have unique class names, it makes it a lot easier, which is why I'm naming it location dashboard grain. It implements i dashboard grain. It basically just has a list of current positions. And whenever it starts up, I go and create, add a little log here. Then I create a timer. So register timer is a helper class from uh, the grain class that I inherit from that allows us to have timers coming back on the same thread that everything else is. So we keep that single threaded thing by using a timer like this instead of setting up like a system.threading.timer uh, or wherever they're located. There's also something called a reminder. Reminders are a little bit different. Timers can run on a fairly rapid cadence, and they're basically only as long as your grain is in memory. But if you put up a reminder, a reminder has, must have a slower cadence, but it can actually start up your grain when it needs to run. So it's persisted. Even if your grain gets removed, the reminder will basically pull your grain back into memory and execute the reminder if it isn't in memory already. But I'm going to go with a timer. I'm going to call send updates. And I'm going to do that every second. So once a second, I'm going to send out updates to tell me where everything is. Then for add position updated, well, it's C sharp. It's not very important or interesting. It's basically current position, contains client key, then add it, otherwise add it like that. Subscribe, well, that's also kind of the same thing. It's just add it to the list of observers. So I have an, a hash set of I dashboard observer. I just store it in there. Unsubscribe, well, not completely surprising. It removes it from that list of subscribers. Once again, pure C sharp, nothing complicated at all. And then for send updates, we basically go ahead and we say that. So I do a console write line, sending updates. And then I do a little select thing to get the format of my positions out to client ID and location. And then I just go through each one of the observers calling on positions updated, passing back that, that positions object. Once again, I don't have to care about it going over the wire or anything like that. It just magically works. And also, this, by the way, is not async. There is no, it doesn't tell you or it doesn't have any proof that it will have delivered the message. The message is fire and forget, and it might not arrive at the, the endpoint that it's supposed to be. That's something to keep in mind, but in some cases that is OK, like in this case. And then I just return completed task. So, and once again, the, uh, the implementation is just simple, pure C sharp. The fact that it's over the wire has no impact whatsoever on the code that I'm writing. And then I'm going to go ahead to my, go to my location tracking grain, because this grain here is going to go ahead and tell that other grain 
that, hey, I got an update, so I keep the, the central repository updated continuously. So what I'm going to do is, inside my constructor here, I'm going to ask for an iGrain factory, like that. Let's store that. So because my grains are registered in the IOC container together with Orleans, my grains are allowed to get injected any services that are registered in that IOC container, including the ones that are being added by Orleans themselves. So I can go ahead and say, hey, can you please give me the grain factory that is used to access grains inside this silo? So I'm just going to get that injected. And once I have that, I can go down to my update location stuff here, and we're going to replace this with something that looks like this. So I'm still... Nope. With something that looks like this. So I still do a right line in here to write out the thing, but I'm also calling grain factory get grain, and here is a little tweak. If you pass in a grid.empty, it's always going to be the same, which means that I'm actually asking for a singleton grain. So I'm always going to get the same grain, no matter of what grain I'm, I'm ask, requesting it from. Grid.empty is going to be unique, and it's going to be the same thing every time. And then I call add position updated to basically tell it that, hey, this grain here has a new location, and that gets stored in the, uh, the, uh, the um, dashboard grain. So now that I have that in place, we should be able to go and start listening to this. And to do that, please don't laugh but I have built a WPF application. You laughed. I just, I just said, please don't laugh. D WPF is fantastic, but I also built it using like the, the latest and the greatest. So it built on .NET Core with WinXC and things like that, using Net7, Windows. Uh, and then I took a dependency on <clears throat> a mapping service. I took a dependency on Bing Maps which isn't actually available for .NET Core, so I get a yellow warning thing and it doesn't really work as it should. But it doesn't matter, it's a WPF application and it runs even though there's a warning symbol. So what I'm going to do in here, inside my main window here, I do a, a, a few little things. So I need an iHost. So inside my main window, what I do in the on initialize is that I go and create a new host like that and I add an Orleans client to it so that I can use Orleans. And then I do some stuff here about on start async and continue with, blah, 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 on closing. Uh, the important part is that when it has started up and the window is, put, is in view, it calls on host started. And when it is closing down, it calls on host stopping. So this is where I need to do stuff. And then there's a method here called update positions, which is responsible for moving the pins around on the actual map as such. Fairly uninteresting for the demo as such. But we want to go ahead and change. Let's see, I'm going to start out with this one. Nope. Nope, sorry. That, I need that first. It even says add that word. Or first, we need this. Let's start with this one. So I'm creating a class here called Dashboard Observer that implements iDashboard Observer. And it basically is just a call through. So whenever uh, on positions updated is being called, it calls this callback function, this action, which I'm going to set up so that it does some stuff for me. Now I have my little implementation of that. Now I can go ahead and I can go up here and we can say, no, there it is. So now I'm going to add a couple of these. So what is happening in here? Well, first of all, I, I ask my host for the uh, iCluster client service so I can talk to my cluster. Then I ask my cluster client service to give me an act, give me an, uh, a proxy to the uh, iDashboard grain with GUI empty. Then here is the funky part. Then I go and create a new instance of Dashboard Observer, which is my implementation of iDashboard Observer. And then I send that to cluster client create object reference of i dashboard observer and get back another thing, which by definition is also an i dashboard observer. And then I pass that version to the dashboard grain uh, subscribe method. Now, I want to point out that this looks weird, and it is weird, 
But what is happening is that we create an instance of something, and then we ask the cluster client to create a proxied version of that thing that can be passed off to the, the silo so that it can get requests coming back. Now, I started out by doing this code like this. And then I ran this code, and it worked perfectly for about 15 seconds, and then it stopped working completely. Then I closed down my application, I started it again, and it worked perfectly for about 12 seconds, and then it stopped working. And that was kind of repetitive, and as a developer, I kind of realized that <laughs> I'm probably doing something wrong. So this observer ref in here is, ha only has a weak reference to the actual implementation. So if we remove this, or sorry, the, the, this, that one, sorry. If we had that one, if we let that go and we don't keep that in memory, that's going to get garbage collected. And when that gets garbage collected, this thing is going to lose its reference and it's going to stop working. So just, if you're doing observables, remember to keep references to your, um, your implementations of your I, the grain observers. Pass that in like that, fairly simple as such, once you figured that out. It took a while, honestly, it wasn't very well documented. And then in on stopping, we just go ahead and we, uh, we unsubscribe our observer ref, so we don't keep getting notifications when we're done. And that's kind of, kind of it. So what's going to happen now is that I'm going to start a silo. Going to do, nope, not add, debug. Do a debug on my silo. That's going to start up a silo. We've seen that before. We're going to go ahead and we're going to start my simulator. We've seen that before as well. And if we look at these two, we should be getting updates now, right? Yep. So this thing is getting updates. So what is happening now is that you also see sending updates coming out here. So it's first of all, all of the grains are, t are telling the dashboard grain that here are my latest updates. And then the dashboard grain every second is going to send all of the current updates out to whoever wants to listen to it. And the thing that is going to listen to it is this dashboard thing here. And if I start that up, it's going to create that grain observer. It's going to pass that along to my, my backend. And all of a sudden, I can externally get updates on everything that's going on in my cluster because I have that observability between the different grains. So as you can see, the little, little pins moving around, that is the updates being moved around. And I'm observing it from the outside of the cluster, which can be really nice. And you can obviously observe not only from the outside, listening to grains inside of your cluster. Grains inside of your cluster can listen to changes in grains inside of the cluster as well. So you can have these dependency between your grains so that they can see what is happening internally. That is pretty sweet. I like it. Somebody asked if I was running very fast, because if you look at the scale, I'm moving ridiculously fast. I'm not a fast runner. But if you just tweak the speed that you send the updates, it goes a lot faster. OK, so observing grains is kind of a neat feature as well can be used for a lot of cool stuff. But one thing that, that I got stuck with that I really enjoyed was persistence. So grains will automatically get the garbage collected, right? Because they're just part of .NET. So if they're not being called continuously, the garbage collector is going to say, hey, you don't need to be in memory anymore. I'm going to throw you out, which is what we want. But we also want to be able to have persistence. We want to make sure that if the garbage collector throws out one of my actors and my grains, I want to be able to rehydrate that and have it back to the state that I had before, right? And there, there are ways to do that. And there is, first of all, there are built-in persistence stuff. So basically, you have these things here. Uh, and they will persist your state in some form of defined state, like ADO.NET, Azure Storage, uh, in memory, which is kind of weird, uh, DynamoDB, and so on. But what they do is they store your state in JSON inside of some storage which means that it's kind of you store stuff separately from your rest of your application because it's just put in here because I want to be able to rehydrate it. If you want to integrate with your own storage mechanism, that is actually quite nice. There's something called iGrain storage that allows you to basically pull data into your grains from an existing state storage, so from existing database, and save it back down there as well, which means that I built a demo for a client in about four hours to do an auctioning system. But I could leave all of their database stuff and everything, could build the, the, the auctioning stuff on top of it, but it would still read and persist the data into their database in their format because I had implemented one of these. And all you need is basically implement three methods, read state, clear, st clear state, and write state. It's fairly simple. 
But you also need to put a persistent state attribute on one of your constructor parameters, and then you need to accept a parameter in your constructor for your, uh, your uh, grain that is of type i persistent state of t. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. So in my grain, it doesn't store the grain as a whole. It stores state objects. Those state objects, in this case being passed in as i persistent state of my state, that is what's going to get persisted and what I'm going to read from. So when this grain here gets activated, the i persistent state of my state, is that state variable is going to be pre-populated with the state that I want in there. And then I can call on that i persistent state to persist things as well. So it doesn't persist the grain, it persists objects inside the grain. But the fact that it's an, uh, an attribute that your parameter to your constructor means that you can actually get state injected from several different things. So you could have this part of my state comes from blob storage. This part of my state comes from this database. This thing here comes from some other place. It's up to you to implement it, which means that you can have a, a, like a combination of state from different sources in the same grain. And it's actually not that hard to do, weirdly enough, uh, because the API is so simple. So I'm going to go to my dashboard grain. So what I want to build is basically I want to keep track. So if, if my up, the, the silo goes down and comes back up again, I want or and my simulators aren't working properly, I want to have the last state, the last position, known position for everything to come back up when I start my dashboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to add an inner class in this location dashboard down here. Let's just, there it is. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to add a an inner class here called dashboard state. And it's going to be just a dictionary string location last known positions. I'm going to default it to a new, new dictionary. That's it. And then I'm going to add a new class in here. Let's go add it here. Add new class, add class. I'm going to call it dashboard state storage. I think I spelled that properly. I'm going to implement that like this. So it's going to really stupid state storage. So it takes a path to store the state. And then clear state, I don't care, because I don't ever clear the state in this demo, but I could have implemented that. Read state and write state. Let's start with write, because it makes more sense. All it really does, it creates a last known positions.json file and puts it in the, the path that I told it to, and serializes the, uh, the state into that. And for read state, I read that JSON file. And as you can see, it, can, it basically says that, hey, you want to read some state. What's the type of state that you want to read? And then so it, I can use the same implementation for different state objects as such if I, if I want to do that. But for this, it's very simple. If you're looking for a location dashboard grain dot dashboard state, then read the information from the last known positions dot JSON file. Now, I'm going to go to the silo here. And inside here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add this. So I'm going to add a named singleton service to my silos services. I'm going to have it's going to be an iGrain storage implementation. It's going to be called dashboard state storage. And when it gets created, when I instantiate it, it's going to go ahead and create a new dashboard state storage pointing it to that location on my hard drive. That's kind of it. And then, once I've got that registered, I can go to my dashboard grain. No, my, yeah, actually my dashboard grain. There it is. I can go in here. And I'm going to, let's see if I'm going to replace this. I am. So in my constructor here, I'm now asking for a persistent state that is going to be the dashboard state storage type that I just registered. And it's going to have an I persistent state of dashboard state. I can store that state like that. And then we can go ahead and change this implementation down here where it says current positions. We're just going to return state dot state dot last known positions like that instead. So we're reading it from the state instead of our in-memory version as such. And then in my send updates, we're going to go in here and we're going to change that to await state dot 
saves, sorry, write state async like that, and that's going to persist it. So every second is going to persist it down, so that if you kill it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work as it should. If I now go and create my silo, debug create silo, I just need to get it sort of initialized to start off. So I'm going to start the silo, going to run my grains, so I'm going to run my simulator. Now it's got some state, so it should have store, stored the last known position. So I'm going to stop that thing. I'm going to stop that thing. So now that JSON file should be available on my drive. So if we kill this thing off, there it is. We start the silo again, but there are no simulators up and running. If we start that. It should now read up that state. So if I pull up my dashboard and I run that, it should be able to find the last known positions for the, all the simulators that was running when the application died, and there they are. So we got basically a way to persist and restore state based on whatever state store that we want. This is a pretty stupid demo, but it kind of shows off the idea that we can have state and we can store it in whatever way we want instead of just having some form of generic JSON storage into blob storage, for example. So I have some comments about it, sort of like thoughts after having worked with it. So first of all, threading. I did mention that it's single-threaded, which makes a lot of things a lot easier. Like I said, the auction system I worked on was really nice, because what they had initially, when we, you're running an auctions, online auction system and you get loads of bids coming in at once, the whole idea of having to go and lock a row in the database and verify that the bid is higher than the previous bid, and while that is being locked, everyone else has to wait, and then if it is higher than the last bid, then it's going to go down and update it and add a new bid and so on, and you have all of these locking things going on, it gets complicated. With Orleans, it was, like I said, I implemented kind of what they had in four hours, and everything is single-threaded, so it means that bids come in in the order that they're sent, basically, and all you have to do is check your in-memory list of your bids and verify whether or not it's higher or lower than the previous bid, and everything is in-memory really, really fast. So it was really nice and offloaded the database a whole lot. However, if you're smarter than me, which some of you probably are, uh, you can go and add attributes to your, uh, your grains to say that, hey, this should be a re-entrant. Basically, it should be multi-threaded. Or you can add uh, always interleave or may interleave, which basically allows other grains to call back into yourself again if you have a chain of grain calls back and forth. Um, but you have to know what you're doing when you're going multi-threaded. I'm just going to say that. Don't use iCluster client. So Chris has now done a one-hour talk and demoed how to use the iCluster client to talk to your cluster. And then at the at last slide, I'm going to say don't use the iCluster client. The reason for this is that the communication between an iCluster client and your cluster cannot be ensured to be secure. Because it uses a bunch of really cool networky stuff under the hood, which means that we don't want to have somebody from the outside talking to the cluster. So if, how do we do that in that, that case? Well, if we look at what I had going on, I also have a little thing in here. I have an API. And this is basically what you should be doing for this scenario instead, is that in your web API, you add Orleans to your, your ASP.NET Core application, and you configure it just as you would in my, my other silo solution. But then you expose a control locations controller, and then you let the, the um, simulator call the API instead. So the simulator shouldn't be talking to the cluster straight away. The simulator should be talking to the API instead. And then the API can talk to the cluster in a secure way, because as the silos are registered in this application, I can use the iGrain factory, which is local to me, and it doesn't use any network coming into the cluster from the outside. So having your, your cluster or an API in front of your cluster and using the iGrain factory is a much, much better solution because it means that you can have security from the client to the API using SSL and logins and things like that. And then you can secure your cluster internally on your network and make sure that all communication between the nodes are, are safe in that way because they are going to be quite chatty and they are not going to be securely chatting between them. So don't use the cluster client unless you have a weird scenario like my WPF application. Other than that, I've got two minutes left. I want to thank you all for listening. The code for uh, what I demoed is available on that address. So if you want to have a look at it, feel free to browse it. Uh, feel, feel free to ping me on, on Twitter if you have any questions. And 
I will be around here and then during the day today at the conference if you have any questions, so just grab me in that case. Thank you so much. <laughs>